Welcome to Peer Spectrum, where we bypass the ordinary and familiar to explore the unsettled edges of medicine, where we tackle real problems in depth with those specialized and dedicated to solving them, where we mine the knowledge and experience spectrum of your peers through long form conversations, not sound bites. Take us with you anytime, anywhere, and get ready to make your downtime count. Get ready for Peer Spectrum with Keith Mankin and Colin Miller. All right, welcome back. This is Colin Miller here with Keith Mankin. We're really excited about today's guest. In fact, it actually took us several months to get him scheduled because, as you'll see, he's a pretty busy guy. Dr. Gavin Francis is a general practitioner based in Edinburgh, Scotland. He's also a prolific traveler and an incredibly talented writer. Today, we're going to explore the 15 months Gavin served as a sole physician at Haley, the British research station in Antarctica. Gavin was it. With no medical team, no backup, and pretty limited equipment, he had to be ready for any medical emergency, large or small. During the winter months, Haley is completely cut off from the rest of the world. Ships can't enter, planes can't land, and oh, you're not going to see the sun until spring. It's hard to imagine being farther off the grid than this. Even the International Space Station has the Soyuz spacecraft ready for an emergency escape. His book, Empire Antarctica, is an account of those 15 months Gavin spent at Haley. It's a fascinating story and a beautifully written book, for which he received the prestigious Scottish National Book Award. We all know plenty of doctors who also write, but after reading this book and listening to Gavin, you may find that he's actually a writer who also practices medicine. Either way, it was a real privilege to have him on. With that said, let's get started. Gavin, welcome to the show. We're just really thrilled to have you today. Well, thank you for inviting me on. Well, let's just start. I recently read your book about Antarctica, and it was just fascinating, and I, I highly recommend it to all of our, our listeners. But let's just start out. Give us an idea of your practice today, what your practice is like, where you're located, and um, how you got into medicine. Um, so right now I live in Edinburgh in Scotland. I'm a family physician about two and a half days a week and um, about half a day a week or so I work in the emergency department and a couple of days a week I write, I write books. And so yeah, my pattern, my balance at the moment is, is almost 50-50 between writing books and practicing medicine, a little bit more weighted towards medicine. So was that always the way right out of medical school or did you, did your practice evolve into this of having more of a hybrid? Oh yeah, very slowly evolved because I, I'm sure it's the same in the United States. When you first qualify as a doctor, it's necessary to work really very, very hard for a number of years. You rotate through various specialties. Um, when I first qualified in 1999, there were still come quite awful rotas of, of, of work for junior doctors. We would be working 90 hours a week or so. Right. And so it was a number of years I was, I was rotating through different specialties. And then, as, as you mentioned, I, I went to Antarctica for a year and a half. And then when I came back from Antarctica, I did more medical specialties, rotating through different ones that would um, prepare me for more emergency medicine and expedition medicine. And then gradually, as the years went by, I moved more into doing general practice, what we call general practice here, which is the kind of medicine where you have your own clinic, your own office, and you just meet people who you're the first port of call, really. So between emergency medicine and general practice or family practice, that's where I found my happiest place in medicine because they're both so general so completely unfiltered hmm. and um, I love the fact that you never know every morning what sort of problems people are going to turn up with right whereas whenever I worked in a specialty I would start to get a little bit bored with the same diagnoses in the same clinics um, but in family family medicine and emergency medicine you never know what's going to happen well, let's take a step back here and t tell us about Antarctica. How, first of all, how did you get chosen for something like this, and what was the draw to do this? Because most of us, I don't even think if we forget Antarctica is there sometimes, but it's it's very isolated. For a large part of the year, you can't even get in and out on an airplane. What was the draw for you, and then how did that process begin, and to actually you uh, being stationed at Haley? Hmm. Well. 
The British Antarctic Survey, that's the National Government Research Programme for Antarctic Science in the United Kingdom, um, they need four doctors a year. So they have three separate bases um, within Antarctica, two on the continent, one on um, the South Georgia, the islands, um, sub-Antarctic islands, really. And then they need a fourth doctor to work on a research ship, so nine-month um, deployments on a, a research vessel which, which sails around the Antarctic Ocean, the Southern Ocean. And so they need these four doctors every year. And I'd always wanted to visit Antarctica. I mean, since I was a little boy, I wanted to go to Antarctica just to see it, that immense, elemental, pristine landscape. And uh, so once I was qualified as a doctor, I started applying for these jobs. I figured out that it would be much better to visit Antarctica and be paid for the privilege than have to pay as a tourist to go and visit it for a few days. <laughs> Well, are they looking for certain medical specialties or certain backgrounds for this? Um, emergency medicine, really. I mean, when I was still at medical school, I knew I wanted to go and do it. And I wrote to them and I said, hey, I want to come and work for you guys once I'm qualified. What should I do? And they wrote back to me. They said, just emergency medicine, emergency medicine. We want you to be able to deal with any problem that comes your way. Right. Um, Everything from dentistry to psychiatry. So, yeah, that's what I concentrated on once I qualified. Wow. Is there, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of competition for these spots? Do a lot of people apply? Yeah, there's quite a lot of competition, but it varies um, depending on what's happening politically in the United Kingdom in terms of medical positions. Sometimes changes in training make it easier or more difficult for people to go. When I applied, there was... Uh, so it was over 10 years ago now. There was about 40 applicants for four posts. Oh, wow. So it was about, yeah, it was about a 10 to 1 ratio. But I think that can vary. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. So tell us about the training and preparation. I mean, they wanted a background in emergency medicine, but in many ways you have to be prepared for almost anything because you're so isolated and so cut off from backup and, and resources. Uh, mm. My understanding from the book, you did rotations with the British military. Is that right? Yeah, well, the the British military have a um, they have a variety of different hospitals around the UK, and there is a national health service, so a government hospital in Plymouth, which from which a great many of the specialist physicians rotate in and out from their posts within the navy, and so that's where our training was based uh, in Plymouth, and so quite a lot of the physicians that trained us were people who had either worked for the, the British Navy or sometimes for the, the Royal Air Force and a few of them from the Army. It was only really the dentists that taught us uh, um, that came from the Army. <laughs> <laughs> Which is something you used quite a bit down there, right? Yeah, well, we had. it's one of the biggest reasons to have to be evacuated is dental abscesses and agonizing pain from toothache. It's one of the biggest reasons for somebody to have to quit a deployment in an uh, expedition environment. It's the simple things, because these people are young and fit by and large. They don't tend to have a lot of medical problems, but anybody can end up getting a dental abscess. So yeah, they, they certainly had to train us in how to handle those. Yeah. Wow. And I assume, yeah. you know, if somebody had appendicitis, you mean you might have to pr prepare for surgical intervention in some cases. Was that part of the training too? Yeah, I mean, we I had to do um, this sort of crash course in anesthetics so that at the beginning of two weeks, I had never really done any anesthetics apart from some um, resuscitation uh, situations. But uh, I'd never really done any general anesthetics in a standard routine way. And by the end of two weeks, I was doing the, the gynae minors list uh, on my own with the, with the attending anesthesiologists just watching on. Wow. So that was great experience. But to be honest, that was another surprise. Uh, the, the military physicians told us that it's very rare that you actually have to operate on an appendix. Um, for those 
who, with a bit of medical knowledge listening, you just, it's enough to go nil by mouth, IV fluids and some large doses of um, uh, keftriaxone and metronidazole, and it tends to settle down. So, yep, I never needed to take out an appendix. Well, that's a, yeah, lucky you, but um, I'm sure, you know, you would have been ready had it, had it, had it come up. But. <laughs> that's right. You were probably itching to do it, too, by that point. <laughs> Um, in the course of your training, did you have access to people who had deployed in Antarctica before? And if so, what did they tell you um, about the experience? Yeah, we met quite a lot of them. And the, the, the training was within the British Antarctic Survey Medical Unit. So mm -hmm. there was various doctors that had been there before helped in our training. Um, also, the... They put us specifically in touch with some of the guys that had been down there in the past and then come back. And um, so we could chat to them about how they were reintegrating to, to normal life, in inverted mm -hmm. commas, and how they were reintegrating to, to a medical career again. Right. Yeah, so there was plenty of opportunity to explore that with people. Well, what amazes me is, you know, the isolation down there. And, and obviously you had a lot of downtime in your, in your station down there. And that was part of the questioning, right? They wanted to know how you would deal with, with those, uh, those aspects. So tell us, mm -hmm. one, how, how the screening process works and what kind of questions they asked you. But also, I understand you, instead of flying down, you took a boat. And it was a pretty long trip. And yeah. that may in many ways have been part of the um, acclimation process. Um, so tell us what mm -hmm. that was like. Yeah, so the, um, the preparation was well you first asked about the interview process so the interview process first of all they wanted to make sure that you are medically competent and so so there were some questions from doctors senior doctors who've been involved with the antarctic medical unit for a while they wanted to to check your clinical knowledge and and how good you have shown yourself to be in the past at thinking on your feet and then the second half of the interview was conducted by some very senior Antarctic managers, base managers or base commanders. So people who have a great deal of experience in, in wintering in the Antarctic and also knowing what kind of pressures that puts on people. And so they asked how you, how you would cope with sharing a base with somebody that you couldn't get on with. They asked how you would cope with, with having weeks and weeks or even months with nothing to do because as a doctor, you're really hoping that you will have almost nothing to do. They asked how I would cope with the isolation, how I would cope with not being able to come home, even if you know I suffered a bereavement or, or one of my family members was very unwell, I wouldn't be able to come home. And so had I thought about that and... How would I cope with that? And when I, before I applied, I'd done a great deal of um, independent traveling, backpacking in the Arctic. And so I was able to tell them that I've spent a lot of time on my own. I've spent a lot of time um, traveling around Greenland and Svalbard and Lapland. And that the isolation and the austerity of the landscape really held no fears for me. It was actually something I looked forward to, something I would embrace when I got there. Interesting. Was there a, um, a physical part of the training? Uh, one thing in medicine, uh, certainly in American medical, medical schools, we don't do any sort of fitness type training, but obviously mm. fitness would be a really important thing in this, in this kind of setting. Yeah, no, there was absolutely none. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> I think they just they just assumed that you would uh, be fit enough to be able to to manage a, a degree of exercise, a degree of coping outside in, in tough conditions and blizzards and so on. I mean, certainly if you had suffered from um, Raynaud's syndrome, you know, which is an intolerance to the cold or, or some environmental uh, weakness that meant you wouldn't cope very well with that environment, then I don't think you could have been appointed. Right. Certainly... Nobody who's got a past history of, of struggling in um, in environments like that they could have they could have appointed them. So maybe they took it for granted that we would be fit enough. And and what sort of uh, 
personal preparation did you do um, about the the uh, loneliness and the isolation? Uh, did you prepare projects in your mind? Did you did you prepare ways to to uh, spend the time, the downtime, or how did you uh, face that that uh, eventuality? Hmm. Yeah, of course. I um. I had never had that abundance of time offered to me before because right. medical school training is so tough, and then being a junior doctor is is so intensive in terms of the hours demanded. I had never had the opportunity to just sit back and have a period of time to think. And so I really look forward to it. And I, I prepared for it. I took a trunk full of books, uh, a couple of hundred books that I wanted to read. Hmm. I didn't get through them all. <laughs> I, I wrote a master's thesis about the effect of the dark on uh, the body clock, circadian rhythms. So I did some research down there. Um, I also wrote my first book down there. So right. my first book was about was a it's called True North. It's a trip about um, the European Arctic, but I'd never had a chance to actually write up that book, even though I'd made the journey a couple of years earlier. And so it was the first chance I had to sit down and write. So it's it's the Antarctic that turned me into a writer, really, because it first gave me the time to really dedicate to that. That's great. I know there are a lot of uh, people listening right now who are in busy practice who are saying, I wish I could do that. I could use the time. But mm. Yeah, well, they could apply. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you have to go. Yeah, you have to go south. For, you have to go south for a year, a year and a half and, and you really can't come back. So not everybody right. is in that situation where they, they can be released for that. Right. Well, were you concerned about leaving your career aside for that long a time? And were your skills diminish? I mean, were, were those concerns that you had? Um, a little bit, but I knew that the British Antarctic Survey Medical Unit, they're very used to this problem. And they're often very supportive and encouraging of the doctors who come back. So if I had so wanted, I'm sure they would have arranged for me to to reintroduce myself gently under supervision back to the emergency department uh, there in the, the Naval Hospital in Plymouth, or I could they would help me with other kinds of placements. In the end, actually, I came back and I went straight into um, just working uh, ad hoc locum shifts in, a, in an emergency department in Glasgow. Mm. And I had a bit of a baptism of fire, but, you know, within a few days I was back to it. Was the baptism fire mostly just the, uh, just the, having more people around you all of a sudden, the busyness and the noise, or was it really just the complete change in schedule? Yeah, and the intensity of seeing so many patients one after another. When for a year and a half you have had all the time in the world to deal with every medical problem that comes your way, and suddenly you're back to just having to make snap judgments in a few minutes and have several patients on the go at once, waiting on um, waiting on scan results, waiting on blood tests, several different patients' problems in your head at once. That took a while to get back into the swing of it again. Sure. Mm. Take us back to the trip down. I mean, what was that like? Because it was, it was fascinating to mm -hmm. read, but there was also some mental preparation, I think, that went along with that journey. And tell us what it was like and how, how the world around you transitioned as you were heading towards the, uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic. Sure. Well, the, the British Antarctic Survey research stations on the continent all need to be provisioned from the UK. And so they do that with a supply ship and the supply ship needs a doctor. So I was lucky enough to get to leave from the UK on a ship. And it took us about two and a half months to sail the length of the Atlantic down to Antarctica. And it was a tremendous opportunity, yes, to start getting used to this excess of time that I would have. And it was it was a beautiful journey, you know, slowly moving down, slowly at about 11 knots, the ship went. First, there's all the storms of getting out of the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay because we set sail in, in October. 
And then as we moved down off the coast of Africa and through the Cape Verde Islands, you know, the sea completely settles and becomes a very calm, tropical seas. And then slowly down over the equator across to Brazil. And then we moved all the way down the coast of Brazil, which goes on for days and days. Mm -hmm. So huge. And then we checked into Montevideo in Uruguay and took on more supplies and some more staff who'd flown out uh, to Montevideo. And then we sailed down the coast of Argentina um, to the Falkland Islands, the Malvinas. And then from there, after that, that's when you really feel you're approaching Antarctica because you cross the Antarctic Convergence and the Roaring Forties, suddenly the the air is full of albatrosses and you see whales breaching and um, yeah, you start to see penguins and fur seals. Huh. Yeah, it's like yeah, passing the, the, the Falkland Islands is like entering another world, really. Now, leaving the Falklands, were you having any doubts at that point, thinking, gosh, am I sure this is my last chance to, to jump off? Uh, no, not at all, because if you... Um, yeah, if a doctor decides not to go, then it's a big problem for the wow. base because they can't really, well, they don't really want to winter somewhere so isolated without a doctor. Right. So I certainly, um, even if I had had second thoughts, by then I would have had to go through with it really because they couldn't have recruited and trained another doctor to replace me. Sure, sure. Well, let's talk about your arrival. So. My understanding, some um, bases, I'm not sure if Haley's this way, but some try to limit contact with the outgoing crew. Um, sometimes mm -hmm. they are, well, just sick of being there, and there may have been some problems, and they would rather you just start out fresh, so to speak. And there's something called mm -hmm. the Haley Stare I read about. But tell us, tell us about your interactions with the crew leaving and how that transition was like, especially as the physician coming in, the, the Z-Doc, as I understand. Yeah. Um well, there are some bases that used to do that. I don't know if there are any that still do. The French, for example, used to forbid any contact between the outgoing and the incoming Antarctic wintering crews. Um, for me, it wasn't like that at all. It was a very, um, I had a very welcome, gentle introduction to over a couple of weeks. The, the summer period at uh, Halley Base is, is frenetic because there's only a short window in which the ship can get in and out in order to reprovision the base while the sea is still uh, melted, while there's not any sea ice around. And so during that brief period, people work 24 hours a day. They work 12 hour shifts night and day mm -hmm. in order to unload the ship and load up all the, the waste from the previous year. And because it's the sun is in the sky 24 hours a day at that latitude, you can work 12-hour shifts through the day or through the night. Um, so it's, it's a very hard working period. And so I, it's my impression that the, the people who've been there for a year, or some of them who'd been there for two and a half years, um, they're kept so busy that there's not really much opportunity to... To, to moan about what a terrible time they might have had or to, to pass on any <laughs> negative feelings to the, the incoming. So, it was, no, it was my impression was that, that it's not really a problem at the British bases anyway that the, the outgoing team are, are going to cast a pall over the incoming team's time there. So what was it like when you first met your counterpart you were, you were leaving there? Yeah, well, I described that in the book. Um, uh, Lindsay, she, she she was actually, we were at medical school together. Hmm. So I knew her from oh, years cool. before. That's neat. Yeah, and we hadn't seen each other for quite a few years, and then we met on the ice down there. Yeah, and she uh, she put me on the back of her skidoo and took me on a tour of the base. And uh, she said, I, I can't decide whether to give you lots and lots of advice or tell you nothing. And I think I've decided to tell you nothing. <laughs> you'll, just, you'll just find it out for yourself and work it out. Yeah. Because as she said, you know, the, these bases are so well provisioned and so carefully prepared for, for being isolated, possibly even for a whole extra year. They have enough supplies at any one time to cope with a whole extra year of not being reprovisioned. Wow. So 
you could turn up there and uh, you could turn up there in some shorts and a t-shirt and you would be fine there's enough stuff there there's books there there's lots of spare clothes there there's everything you would need for a year wow well, what kind of equipment did you have just medical equipment um it was quite simple but effective you know i had a little um a little anesthetic machine uh that worked on sevoflurane i had an uh, a sort of battlefield x-ray unit so um it was quite a small unit but it was very heavy and it, it fastened on to a, a stand and you change the exposure according to the 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 duration rather than the intensity of the beam so for example if you wanted if you wanted to take a pelvic x-ray then your patient would have to lie still for quite a long time, about half a minute. Wow. Whereas if you wanted to take uh, an x-ray of your little finger, you know, it was just very, very quick. So uh, there was a dark room for developing photos and also for developing the x-rays. Um, we just developed them in, um, in, in baths of chemicals. Hmm. And I had a little microscope for doing cell counts. Right. Yeah, everything you need. There was even a um, there was even a a, a burr hole drill for neurosurgery. Hmm. Uh, thankfully, I never needed to use that. But yeah, it was there. It was, it was there in the cupboard with a little sign saying, "Not to be used in anger." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Was there uh, any medical support staff? Were there uh, medical corps people or anything to to give you an extra set of hands? Uh, no, I gave some extra training to the cook. Oh, okay. Just in case. <laughs> yeah. So no, it was just um, just one um, clinical uh, person sent south. Well, if you look yeah. at the group of people you were with, how many were scientists doing full time research, and how many were support staff, like uh, a cook, for example, or people who yeah. had other roles to support the base? Yeah. It's about half and half. So my year it was there was only six scientists and um, eight support staff, fourteen of us. Yeah. So the other thing is the interpersonal dynamics there, you know. And if you have half and half, I mean, these are people who may not normally spend a lot of time together in, in normal in the normal world. Tell us about the personal mm. dynamics there, and just you know how often you'd want to have time just to yourself, but other times where you'd want to all have a group dinner together. What was a, a typical day like, just interacting with your colleagues there? Hmm. Well, there's plenty of opportunity to go and be on your own if you really want to be on your own, because during the winter, everybody has their own bedroom, for example, to retreat to. You have to share a room during the summer period, but the summer period is pretty short. So there's spaces to go to either, you know, I always had the, the medical surgery to be in or there's the library there was a small gym lots of places to go and be on your own but by and large people came together every every meal time so you'd see people at breakfast see people at lunch see people in the evening meal and then every weekend um on the saturday night there would be a big formal more special dinner where the cook would really put on a good effort and everybody would come together so i think there is a good balance between um there's an expectation that, that you are seen and you're slightly more social so everyone can check on one another and check they're doing all right. But there's also opportunity to, to retreat and be on your own. Hmm. Yeah, I think they've got a good balance after, you know, the, the British Antarctic Survey have been sending people down there for oh, 70 years. And so they've, they've built up a pretty good system, which by and large works to keep everybody uh, getting along. And you have to remember as well that people know that there is absolutely no possibility of escape. So people are more careful and cautious in their, the way they speak to one another. They don't deliberately wind one another up because they know that they're going to be eating breakfast, lunch and dinner with the same right. people for the next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah. Interesting point. Yeah. And they do allow alcohol, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, anybody uh, overindulge <laughs> from time to time, or how, how did you manage that? 
I'm thinking about Navy yeah, ships where they don't allow it, you know, and, and uh, this, that's interesting. Yeah, well, from time to time, yeah, of course, people as human nature, and uh, sometimes um, you have to pick up the pieces the following morning, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, well, as the doctor, I kind of felt I had a duty of care to be a bit more conscientious, and right. so... Yeah, I I never wanted to be in a position where I couldn't stitch somebody's head up, for example. Right. Good sure. point. <laughs> so well, let's talk so about that for is, a minute. Oh, go ahead, Keith. Yeah, so I was just going to ask, what's your recommended hangover uh, cure? <laughs> you must have a good one. Oh, no, I, sorry, I don't have anything special. Just the usual combination of uh, caffeine, sugar, and greasy food. Uh, there we go. I think. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Well, did you ever feel that you needed to keep a, a professional distance from your, well, in many cases, patients there, or was it a different dynamic there? Um, did you feel that you'd have to, I mean, obviously you, you want to always be in a position where you could to be ready to help, you know, but also mm. be able to step into the, the doctor's white coat when you need to, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, and I think um, people are understanding of that as well, that the doctor has to retain a a little bit of um, distance in the sense that you have you can't possibly join a, a clique um, or or take sides in any ongoing argument because because you need to retain a little bit of objectivity and right. and deal with the, the 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 mental health consequences of any big arguments on base and so um, yeah I think people are quite forgiving of that need for the, the physician on base to, to keep a little bit of distance from that. I don't know how well I, uh, I accomplished that. You'd need to ask my base mates. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so now you're in the midst of this. Was the isolation what you expected it to be? Was the preparation helpful? I mean, you can say, well, I've been up in, in the Arctic Circle, I've done all these things. But when you actually get into it, a lot of times I find the experience is just so much bigger and so much broader. And I've never experienced anything like that. How did you mm. actually find it? You were, you were prepared for it, but were you prepared for it? Um, I don't think anybody can prepare you for what it's like to, for example, go three and a half months without seeing the sun, you know, the, right. through the polar winter. Um, nobody can prepare you for the fact that no matter what's going on at home, you can't come back. Nobody can really, truly prepare you for what you're going to say at dinner when you're sitting with the same 13 other people for the 200th time. <laughs> and you know, you've got, you've got another 150 odd times to right. sit with them. Um, so in that, from that point of view, no, I don't think anybody could have prepared me. But then I don't think anybody could have prepared me for how beautiful it was either. Nobody could have prepared me for what it was like to to be up at night. On we we used to take turns and do a week of night watch in case there was a fire on base, so somebody was always awake. And um, so nobody could really prepare me for what it would be like to be the only person awake for thousand miles in any direction hmm. under one of the most incredible magnificent skies it's possible to find on on earth because there's no light pollution there's ceaseless auroras during the winter there's meteor showers and the clarity of the sky and the lack of clouds means that you get quite used to watching the wheel of the stars above you you get to know all the constellations nobody could have prepared me for that and also, nobody could really have prepared me for how, what a luxury it was to have the time to to read all the books that I'd wanted to read and take time thinking about the things I wanted to, to think about. Yeah. And I, one of the things it touches on in this book, um, Empire Antarctica, is that just a few miles away, there was the largest colony of emperor penguins in Antarctica. And so... I think nobody could have prepared me for how wonderful it was to go and visit these emperor penguins regularly and see their incredibly mm -hmm. difficult lives. Um, they really are the nature's survivors. Right. You did a beautiful job describing that, and they are incredibly resilient creatures. 
Tell us what you mm. learned from them and, and what it was like just standing around thousands of them, almost walking through you. What was that like? Um, yeah, they they are quite unique, I think. I mean, I once I once described them um, at an event where I was talking about this book. I said, um, I said, emperor penguins, they're not very clever. In fact, I think they're quite stupid. And there was a, an ornithologist there and he said, Emperor penguins are not stupid. They're exactly as clever as they need to be. <laughs> and um, that's very, it's true. They're just the most extraordinary creatures. They can, you know, they lose half their body weight when they fast for four months straight while incubating these eggs. They, all these blizzards that I was coping with, they were coping with it out in the open. And temperatures down to minus 55 degrees Celsius and uh, winds of up to 200 miles an hour. Mm. So... I really, they, they deepened my sense of awe at how magnificent nature really can be. Um, but I was glad I didn't need to learn from them how to survive out in the open through an Antarctic winter. <laughs> well, tell us about, um, about some of the research that was happening there. I mean, there was, you know, about six of them were, were doing research of various kinds. How much did you interact with them? Did you assist them at all? What was your involvement? You know, what were people trying to achieve there? Um, well, Halley Base was where, for example, they discovered the ozone hole in 1985. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very long running science project examining the, the depth of the ozone layer. And so there were measurements taken daily of that. There was, it's a weather station. So every day we'd be launching weather balloons and sending data back to the the big supercomputers that try to map uh, the planet's weather and predict it. Um, there was a chemistry lab that was examining pollutants within the air because it's some of the cleanest air on Earth blows through Halley Base. And then there were also um, some scientists who were examining the magnetic fields because it's um, it's an interesting place to measure the magnetic fields, Halley, which is why the the, the density of, of auroras, aurora australis that you see there is so high, um, because the, the magnetic field is quite weak there. So, yeah, there were all sorts of different projects. And yes, I got to, to know a little bit about what they were all doing and help where I could. But mostly my help um, was down to, you know, taking weather observations or launching weather balloons, that sort of thing. So what was a typical day like for you then? I mean, did you try to structure yourself and schedule yourself as much as possible? I mean, you mentioned staying busy helps. Um, mm. What? It, maybe there wasn't a typical day. Maybe that's the wrong question, but maybe pick a, pick a day and tell us what that was like. Yeah, no, I tried to give myself quite a strict routine because I think especially when there's no night and no day, it's just always light or it's always dark. It's quite important for your mental health and your physical health to impose a shape to the day. Right. So, yeah, I would always get up at about 8 o'clock and I'd always have breakfast with the few others that were up then. And then I would um, work for two or three hours, either on this master's thesis looking at um, circadian rhythms or, uh, as I said, I was writing my first book then, the one about the Arctic. And then around about lunchtime, um, or just before lunch, I would go and visit some of the others at their workstation, see what they were up to, have lunch. And then after lunch, I would just go skiing every day. Um, I just used nice. to do I used to do circuits of the perimeter. Right. So I was very I was very fit. I used to ski. <laughs> Over that year, I skied hundreds and hundreds of miles and and with um, cross country skis. You know, it was very flat where I was. Oh, I bet it was incredibly beautiful, too. I bet you really look forward to that every afternoon. Yeah, exactly. It was good to shake off the spreadsheets and the computer screens and just um, go skiing. Yeah. And so every so often you'd have to basically be on fire watch. You know, everybody would have to pull that duty. Were there other just regular tasks and duties that you were assigned outside of medicine? Uh, yeah, yeah. I had other things I had to do. I was in charge of all the waste disposal. So I had compactors and I would have to move um, various drums of stuff around the base and um, um, so yeah plenty of things then there was the refueling of the base from um, kerosene drums we'd have to break the kerosene drums out of their storage down in the ice and and then every day we would have to 
dig ice into a melt tank in order to have drinking water and um, washing water. Wow. So you're constantly digging fresh fresh snow or fresh ice down into a melt tank every day in order to, to keep reprovisioning the base. Yeah, you were definitely staying in good shape, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It kept me kept me fit. I mean, it's it, it habituated me to a level of exercise that can be difficult to maintain when you're in a normal uh, city medical practice. So I have to try to find my exercise in other ways. One thing I remember reading about is is the crevasses. You know, and these are things that you really can't see or very difficult to anticipate. Mm. And there were areas that, that had been cleared out that were were marked as safe for travel, but. Just the, the idea of just being, you know, falling into one of these, it's just almost, a, it's just a terrifying thought. But give us an idea. I mean, you're out skiing. Were you able to go by yourself? When were you able to go by yourself? How far were you able to go? Um, what kind of yeah. safety precautions did you take? So um, around the base, there was quite large areas that had all been certified crevasse-free. And so they had um, old, empty, black kerosene drums marking safe routes so you could ski quite happily alone without any um, rope or harness around any of those areas but then if you wanted to go further afield or go out onto ice um, that, that nobody had been to so every so often we did we would go out and explore different parts of the the area and if we were going where there hadn't been a drum line laid down then yeah we would have to go in pairs roped up so if we're on skidoos, the two skidoos would be roped to one another. And if we were um, on foot, then we'd be roped, uh, similarly roped in pairs in case one fell down a crevasse. Yeah. And down at Halley, there's, you know, there's several, there have been several deaths in the past, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people had fallen down crevasses. And it's quite, mm -hmm. so, you know, it's terrible, tragic, tragic accident. And so, yeah, the... The, the people in charge had had worked out areas where it was safe and areas where it was not in order to prevent such terrible tragedy happening. Yeah. One thing that struck me earlier in your book is you mentioned you, you first arrived at the base, you're looking through the exam room, the, the equipment there, and you find something that was called the confidential medical files. So these were files that had gone back all the way to the founding of the base there. Mm. And... It looked to me like there was code words for certain things. You know, there's uh, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Tell us about these files or what you can. And obviously, you decided at that moment you weren't going to to explore those until you left. But what was in yeah. there that you can tell us about? And how did that show the psychological makeup and changes and dynamics going on in, in the people who were stationed at Haley? Mm. Well, I don't think it's just um, the Halley base. You can there's an extensive literature of this. You can look up in um, various uh, military and aerospace journals. People have psychologists have been studying the negative effects of of um, what they call ice isolated and confined environments for decades because of things like the Mars missions and. Um, and also saturation divers who have to stay down um, at the bottom of the sea doing things sometimes for days on end. Mm. And so there's quite an extensive literature looking at this. And, and it also from other bases in Antarctica, you know, there was a Greenpeace base, for example, where there was a lot of conflict. Um, the US, some of the US bases have had difficult years too. And so, yeah, when I, when I picked up that big pile of confidential medical reports, I didn't want to look at it at the beginning of the year because I knew that they would describe some of these years ahead of me where just there'd been a lack of friendliness had set in and a kind of bitterness and frustration had set in and people had stopped being civil to one another and started to be kind of um, rude and obstructive with one another. And, and I think when you're so far from home and so far from your boss or from any kind of arbitrator there's a tendency for some people in some particularly stressful situations to lash out and i think there's no doubt that that's a risk when you're in an isolated and confined environment and i was just very glad that my year 
actually that didn't happen. We all stayed civil to one another, and in fact, many of us are still in touch. That's great. Wow. So maybe there mm. is hope for the Mars mission after all, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And the people as well who are selected for these things, they're, they've been quite carefully selected to, to make sure that they're not going to be the kind of people who, who take their frustrations out on others, you know? Yeah. Right. In fact, I think it's more of a problem now than it used to be because now um, everybody down in the Antarctic bases has constant internet access. But, you know, when I was there, they didn't have internet access. And so you'd, you'd need to find solutions to the friction on base. You had no yeah. option but to find solutions. Well, that's, did you have a satellite phone? Was there any other way to communicate back home? Yeah, there was a satellite phone, but it was very expensive. Hmm. And um, the day the um, the day the ship left, it rang actually, and it was my boss uh, back in the hospital in Plymouth. And he said, "How are you feeling?" And I said, "Well, <laughs> you know, excited, a little bit frightened. I think it'll be okay." And he said, well, I was just phoning to tell you that for the next 10 months, um, if you need anything, just give me a ring. But we're not coming to get you. That's right. <laughs> but, if, but if you want to talk, everything's good. And I like that. Yeah. 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 So, so that, um, that was a nice escape valve. But I didn't phone him, actually, all year. I didn't yeah. need to. It's yeah. good. So I hate to, um, to leave Antarctica, but uh, in the interest of time, let's bring you back to Scotland and bring you back to the real world. What, mm. what um, you talked about uh, before about the hustle and the, the baptism of fire, but um, yeah. how long did it take you to get back into the swing of things and what lessons did you bring back? What, how were you changed as a doctor by spending the time in Antarctica? Well, I think... Um it took maybe only th oh, six months or so, six months back into it to to feel just as confident in the emergency department, say, as I'd felt before I left. Yeah, a few months. And I think an experience like that is really valuable, and I'd really encourage anybody who who is thinking about going to, to get into expedition medicine, I'd encourage them to go for it because... It might not be the specific things you learn, although, you know, the dental anesthetic blocks I learned and so on are still quite useful. Mm -hmm. It might not be the specifics, but it's just the fact that you did it and that you flourished in it, thrived, enjoyed it. That can give you an immense sense of achievement and satisfaction that you carry with you from then on. And so... I don't, I don't have a hankering or a frustration that I am wanting to be back in Antarctica all the time because I've been there and I've done that and I really enjoyed it and I lived it fully while I was doing it. Um, but life is short. There's lots of different possibilities and uh, now I want to do different stuff. Right. So I would encourage people to go for it and, and fulfill their ambitions if that's what their ambitions are because that can give you a great sense of achievement to carry on doing something different again. Yeah. It, do you find the medical system where you are is a little bit more forgiving of taking time off to travel for an expedition? Because I'm not sure the American system is built to tolerate that. I, I hope it is, and I, I hope um, I hope we can encourage some of our listeners to look into this. But is there something unique about the British system or about where you are that would allow you to do this? Um, no, I think, I mean, I think even in Britain, if I had been dead set on a career in cardiothoracic surgery or dead set on um, another one of these careers that takes, you know, that everybody has got, has to do a PhD worth of research and, um, and spend years and years and years of very exacting training, perhaps... Um, they would have frowned on that, and I would have struggled to get back in. I'm not <laughs> sure, though, because, you know, ever since I got back from Antarctica, you can be sure you always get shortlisted for interview because people want to talk about it. So, right. It's a great story. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. When it's on your, if you've got something like that on your resume or your CV, then, then everybody wants to ask you about it. So, yeah, usually, although you might not get the job, you'll certainly get invited to interview to talk about it. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, I've never had any problems finding work because by the very nature of my work, it's very general and um, there's lots of demand for it all over the place. I've found it only helped me. It's only helped my career. It's only helped me do more of what I want to do. So I've had a very positive experience. So that's, that's great. Yeah. And maybe more people in the United States would benefit from that kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know on the system there, but certainly the United Kingdom, it's, it's, it's looked on as a good thing to follow your enthusiasms. You know, there's no point faking your ambition to do something. You know, do the things you're enthusiastic about it, that you love, and, and then success will follow. It might not be the thing that you intended to do originally, but it'll be the thing that you're most enthusiastic about. That's a, that's a great lesson. And we're getting close to the end of our time here, so we obviously want to be respectful of your time, Gavin. But um, just tell us, about, tell us about your most recent book and, and what you're working on right now. Yeah, well, I've been um, working in family medicine, emergency medicine now for um, nearly 10 years. And I really, my, my enthusiasm for medicine and for generalism has not abated at all. I still really love my work. And part of that, I think, may be to do with the, the fact that I'm quite in control of being able to, to work a certain number of days and have certain amounts of time set out for writing. And I'm really interested in the idea of how our vision of the body as doctors and as lay people, as general society, has changed slowly over history. And so my most recent book was a kind of exploration of the body from cultural and philosophical as well as clinical perspectives. It moves slowly from the, from, from the brain, so from a time as a, a trainee in neurosurgery, all the way down the body eventually ending up in, uh, in the foot and exploring all these aspects of the body from not just a clinical point of view, but, but more of a literary or a philosophical or an artistic point of view and how that vision of the body can really fire up and infuse the practice of medicine and keep you clinically very switched on and clinically very engaged with what a privilege and a wonder it is to be a doctor. Well, Gavin, as we close here, tell us how we can learn more about you and some of your other writings and work, and where can people find you online? Yeah, they could. Um, I, I've got a website. It's just my name, uh, gavinfrancis.com, uh, um, F-R-A-N-C-I-S. And um, I tweet very intermittently um, at Gavin Frank, G-A-V-I-N-F-R-A-N-C, and so, yeah, between Twitter and my website, I'll, I put up different information every so often about um, projects that I'm doing, lectures I'm giving. I was in the States last October, so I don't know if I'll be there for a little while. Um, also, I'll be putting up more information about a book I've got coming out next May. So May 2018, I've got a book called Shapeshifters coming out. So, yeah, keep an eye for that oh, if you like these other ones. <laughs> yeah, which we Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, tell us uh, connections if people are interested in expedition medicine. Is there a place you would refer people to find out more? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, from the British context, there's um, there's a society, there's a British society of uh, expedition medicine. From the British Antarctic Survey point of view, then, um, yep, they look at their website, bas.ac.uk, I think it is. Um, they're they're just a very wonderful organization to work for and um from the point of view of expedition medicine yeah the, the sky's the limit really you know i went in a very formalized system to work for a government program but there's lots of different opportunities out there with tour companies with mountaineering companies and so on so yeah my mission is to try and encourage people to keep doing the things they love and then Hopefully they won't get burned out with medicine and they'll keep practicing with, with love for it and with enthusiasm for it. Yeah, absolutely. So we hope Reach to. Reach on, brother. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, Gavin, thank you again for sharing your time today. I mean, this was a lot of fun and a real joy having you on today. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, everybody, that was Dr. Gavin Francis. 
And this is Colin Miller here with Keith Macon on Pure Spectrum. Wherever you are, whenever you're listening to this, take care. We'll see you here next time. Thanks for joining us on Pure Spectrum. Please support the show by writing a review on iTunes and join the conversation at purespectrum.com. Keep up with the latest episodes and share your ideas with us on Twitter, Facebook, or email at purespectrum.com.